at the University of Groningen in uh, the Netherlands. And we are, we are having three speakers. The first one will is uh, Mark Dukan from uh, Germany. Denmark. From Denmark, sorry, from, you are from Denmark. <laughs> and Mark will talk about the impact of de-risk financing of capital support costs for onshore wind and solar PV in Europe. After Mark, we will have Anselm Eike, he's from Germany. Well, Anselm seems to be a Danish name, but it is a German name, isn't it? Okay, and he will talk about locational instruments and solar electricity markets. Also really, really relevant topic with all the congestions within different countries. And the third speaker is Christina Pizarro. In it, sir, and she will talk about an option analysis of renewable support me mechanism dealing with the uh, allocation of risk between consumers and uh, investors. Now I am giving the floor to the first speaker, to Mark. You are having max 25 minutes. After the presentation, we will have five minutes for, for discussion. And to all the attendees, please feel free to ask a question through the chat uh, during the presentation. And after the presentation, we will have time for uh, answering and uh, discussing, having some discussion. Okay, and great. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, uh, hi, hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining this session. Uh, first of all, can you see my screen correctly and hear me? Okay, perfect. Yes. So, um, yes, basically, um, I'm going to give a presentation about a study that I'm working on um, within my PhD and also within the uh, Auris 2 project um, called Estimating Support Cost Savings from the Risking Renewables in Europe. Uh, my name is Mark Jokan and I'm a PhD student at um, the Technical University of Denmark at both DTU Management and DTU Wind. And this study has been done together with uh, Lena Kitzing uh, from DTU Wind. Um, so, first of all, uh, to motivate the discussion, um, as you may know, uh, costs of capital around Europe, uh, they uh, vary a lot. So if we, for instance, have a, therm a thermometer for cost of capital, then um, in the red, uh, we would have Latvia and Lithuania with cost of capital around 9 to 10%. Um, they are also high in some Southeastern European member states. Then we have Italy and Hungary in the middle uh, with about 4 to 6%. And uh, Germany and Denmark um, have the best um, cost of capital. Um, I would like to ask if you can mute yourself. Um, somebody is speaking. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, <clears throat> so basically, uh, the point is that uh, there is a big difference in uh, cost of capital across uh, the EU, uh, and uh, this is essentially uh, an issue, and it's an issue because uh, cost of capital are a major part of uh, renewable energy generation costs. So uh, this is an example of an onshore wind farm um, where basically you can see that when cost of capital or uh, the weighted average cost of capital, when they reach around 8%, then already the financing costs uh, are eat up about half of the generation costs. And as you can see, uh, in some countries in the EU have even higher cost of capital than 8%. So in, in, in the, so essentially, uh, this, this is an issue for uh, cost effectively reaching EU climate and energy targets. Um, so uh, in the light of this, uh, we um, made this study and we focus on the following research questions. So number one, under the current financing conditions, what are the expected uh, auction wind prices and support costs for onshore wind and solar PV projects? Uh, we focus on um, auction bid prices to frame the entire discussion uh, within the framework of um, the transition of support policies in the EU uh, to auctions for to, that are used for allocating renewable energy support. Um, 
Then uh, the second research question, what are the expected support cost savings from de-risking um, cost of capital? And more specific, uh, we differentiate this between uh, debt and equity financing. And then also we focused on a small sub uh, research question, which is, uh, are there any differences between uh, in support costs between different remuneration uh, scheme designs uh, across the EU? Uh, and here we then focused on three different designs, and these are costs, um, two-sided contract for difference, contract, contract for differences, then one-sided um, sliding premiums, and also fixed premiums. Um, so um, I will first explain uh, the methods that we use, and then the results, and then go at the end um, into a discussion about the results. So um, as a first step, uh, we leverage the results of a financing survey, uh, which was conducted within the Auris 2 project, um, which um, focused on project financing conditions. Um, so uh, this means uh, that we basically gathered data uh, in structured interviews with 80 people from 78 organizations. Uh, and this data includes uh, cost of debt or interest rates, uh, then cost of equity, the ECR requirements, loan tenors, but also uh, we gather data on work levels and depth size. Uh, and we did this for uh, onshore wind projects and solar PV. Uh, we didn't do it for both in all uh, the EU member states. Uh, this mainly depended on the availability of um, experts that we uh, talked with, or actually that the financing survey contacted. Um, and also recent developments in these industries um, across the EU. Uh, in step number two, we created a cash flow model, um, which is basically optimizing or calculating bid levels that make the uh, expected net present value equal to zero. Uh, we also use uh, DSCR uh, requirements as an input to our model to size depth using depth sculpting. Uh, and then uh, accordingly, we calculate our own wax despite having collected WAC levels in the survey as well. And uh, we use this and we do this uh, using Excel sol solver, basically, um, and um, coding in VBA. Um, the outputs that we get uh, are the bid levels, uh, and then also the support costs uh, in euros per megawatt hour over lifetime. We also get uh, calculated WAC levels, but as I said, also an output is also the depth size of the projects. Um, and in step number four, we do a sensitivity analysis uh, where we examine the impacts on financing conditions and also the impacts of, of changing financing conditions and also the impacts of um, other investment and market related variables. I will now go into a little bit more detail about some of these individual steps. So um, first of all, regarding the survey, the financing survey that was conducted. Uh, so as I said, we got um, a certain number of uh, survey inputs and these survey inputs, they contained a range um, for some estimates. So for instance, uh, the, the respondents, they would uh, respond uh, about their specific projects or about country estimates. And then, we, and then uh, however, they did not read uh, these data from uh, term sheets. Uh, they were using basically more their memory. So they would sometimes say, ah, it's between five or 6% uh, or the DSCR requirement is between 1.2 and 1.3 and so on. So basically we had these ranges. What we then did is we divided these ranges uh, and we created uh, combinations of uh, the best range estimates, where we have the minimum cost of debt, minimum cost of equity, minimum DSCR requirement, and maximum loan tenor, and then the worst range, where we have the opposite um, worst financing conditions. We then combine this also to uh, or average them. And what this gave us is that we got from 187 estimates of financing conditions, we got 561 sub scenarios which we treat each as an individual uh, project uh, and which we then use and run in our cash flow model. And also 
Um, one thing to note is that collecting data like this is good to get uh, an overview of um, conditions across a broader range of countries. Uh, however, uh, the limitation of doing this is that since you don't focus on one country, um, your data might not be, you know, um, you, you, you don't collect uh, 50 inputs for Germany, you collect less inputs or, you know, even for some countries, even less. So uh, these are the data inputs or the number of data inputs that we collected uh, across the EU for um, wind onshore and solar PV. And as you can see, in some countries, um, there are more inputs, in some countries, uh, there are less. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, this financing survey should be treated more as an estimation or approximation of uh, the current conditions. Um, yeah, um, and, and obviously, uh, in some countries, the data number is very low, and it's therefore not um, highly representative, perhaps. Um, in regarding the cash flow model, uh, so basically, we, we do an expected, uh, we calculate an expected net present value. Uh, where we have three scenarios. First scenario uh, that we assign a 90% probability is that the project is realized on time and that it doesn't occur any penalties. So as I said, we put um, this cash flow model in the context of auctions. So in, in auctions, you have penalties if you are delayed with the realization of the project. Um, in scenario number two, which we assign a 5% probability is that the project is delayed. Uh, by one year and therefore it pays a penalty and then in the third step the project is basically uh, abandoned it pays a penalty and the support is cancelled and based on this we calculated the expected uh, net present value uh, of each of the sub scenarios um, regarding our optimization model that we automate in VBA, uh, basically we minimize the bid level here while varying the bid level and the depth size. As I said, we use uh, DSCR requirements as an input to the model that are used um, to sculpt a debt repayment schedule and then calculate the depth size in the end, which corresponds to standard project financing um, way of sizing debt. Um, and uh, we use these constraints, so debt share between 0 to 100, and that the balance and maturity uh, basically needs to, um, for these expected um, scenarios, that it needs to be equal to uh, 0, meaning that when the loan tenor ends, the balance and maturity needs to be equal to 0, and that the net present value is equal or bigger than uh, zero, but we get that it's equal to zero in all of the results that we get. Um, so um, one thing to note is that then in the sensitivity analysis, um, we, and, and actually how we define this, this de-risking potential. So basically um, we collected these financing conditions and then for each country, there is a certain average we define the risking as moving from this average, which we calculate ourselves, to a lower level or a minimum surveyed financing condition per country and technology. And uh, what we do is we construct multiple scenarios where first we vary all financing conditions to see what is the effect on support costs from the risking in that case. Then we only um, do this for debt financing, then only for cost of debt, cost of equity, then also individually DSCR and loan tenors. But besides this, we also vary other investment variables, including uh, CAPEX values, capacity factors, uh, OPEX values, and the electricity price expectation. Uh, for the electricity price expectation, um, we can talk about that perhaps more later, but we use a um, um, relatively simplistic way to calculate this and assume a uh, in a baseline scenario of 1% linear uh, increase, which we, on a yearly basis, which we correct for market value factors um, that we have calculated ourselves based on um, equations that correlate the extent of the expansion of a certain type of renewables in a country with a decrease in um, its market value and uh, which are based on the publications of Leon Hirt. 
Um, so we account also for the cannibalization effect a little bit here. Uh, in terms of the sensitivity analysis, an important thing to note is that we do this in two steps. Uh, so in step number one, we do it for uh, all of the scenarios that we have, which includes all 34 country technology cases, which gives us high level results. But then in the next step, we do it only for four country technology cases, including onshore wind in Germany, Denmark, UK, and uh, Greece, which then gives us a little bit more specific insights. And we do it in a form of this waterfall model so that um, you know it's nicer and easier to visualize. Um, uh, in terms of the results, uh, these are our uh, expected bid levels. Um, these are our expected bid levels uh, for all the 561 scenarios. As, uh, and as you can see here, we divide it in according to the three remuneration schemes. Uh, so these are uh, contract for difference on the left, then two, two sided contract for difference, then one sided sliding premiums and fixed premiums. So as you can see uh, among the CFD countries, um, Ireland would achieve the lowest and UK the lowest um, bid levels, whereas uh, PV and onshore wind in Latvia the highest within the sliding premium countries, Spain, solar PV in Spain will achieve the lowest uh, price, uh, whereas PV and onshore wind in Slovakia the highest and regarding fixed premiums, Denmark would achieve here the lowest price, whereas the highest would be achieved in Romania. And of course, fixed premiums cannot be directly compared with CFDs and sliding premiums because in fixed premiums, you simply bid for a top up on the electricity price, whereas in CFDs and in sliding premiums, you bid for basically uh, either a one-sided or two-sided floor price. Um, so um, the question is now, okay, so uh, if we have these bid levels, uh, which we use to then calculate support costs, how does then WAC or cost of capital relate to this? So here we divide the countries uh, across the three remuneration schemes uh, in yellow, the CFDs and in black, the fixed premiums and in blue, the sliding premiums. And uh, as you can see, there is some um, tendency for the countries here uh, that, uh, that, oops, sorry, that have a lower um, WAC value to also have um, slightly lower support costs. However, there are very important outliers. So for instance, if you look at Germany, which is in the bottom right corner, Germany here has a very high support cost, but it has the lowest WAC level in Europe. And uh, why is this? It's simply because the difference between the required bid level and the assumed um, capture price is very large in Germany, um, uh, which then uh, increases the need for support. So actually, this emphasizes the fact that WAC is not the only and perhaps not the main uh, actually element that drives uh, support costs. Um, and uh, also, as you can see here, these countries are very scattered uh, in terms of um, in terms of this. So um, I wouldn't say that there is any uh, big connection uh, between uh, which remuneration scheme design has uh, a tendency to have higher or lower support costs. Um, in terms of our general results for all the 34 country and technology cases, uh, as you can see here, on average, um, debt financing would uh, induce a support cost saving of 3.3 euros per megawatt hour, equity financing almost twice as less, and uh, changing just tenors and DCR requirements would have a very, very small effect. However, as you can see, the other uh, investment inputs uh, have also significant impact. So for instance, just changing this electricity price scenario from a 1% linear increase to a 2% linear increase would have an effect which is almost the same as um, de-risking debt financing on average. And then also capacity factors have also a very big impact as well as capex values. So uh, this implies that um, better site conditions um, are an important aspect also of keeping support costs down because a better site, condi site conditions means a greater amount of megawatt hours or greater revenues, which means lesser demand for support. Um, to go on, these are the results 
for then the four countries that we focused on. And just to also clarify, so we focus on these countries because they have different risk levels and because they use different remuneration schemes. Uh, so Greece and UK use a two-sided contract for difference, whereas Germany uses a one-sided sliding premium and Denmark a fixed premium. And um, also they have different risk levels. So Greece has a higher VAC level than the other countries. Um, so what we can see here is, first of all, uh, that um, we can achieve negative support costs in Denmark and UK only actually by uh, de-risking. So and you, you can see that uh, if you go to, um, to these two countries, uh, you can see where the yellow part ends to the left, it ends already below zero. So which is, um, which is very interesting. Um, Second thing is that uh, debt risking effects vary. So in some countries, uh, these effects are higher uh, so than the average. So for instance, in Greece, uh, the effect would be much higher than the average of 3.3, whereas in Denmark, it would be slightly uh, lower. And an important thing is that also uh, capex and capacity factors, they seem to have a larger relative impact in uh, lower risk countries on uh, support costs. Uh, in terms of uh, the validation of our results, um, here we compare the uh, modeled uh, depth share and then also the depth share that was surveyed and then the VAC which we calculate ourselves and the VAC that was surveyed. So as you can see here, there are differences in the depth share or the depth size uh, that, we, that we model. In some countries, uh, this is less than what we surveyed, and in other countries, it's more than what we surveyed. Um, in terms of the VAC levels, they tend to follow the surveyed values, however, with some exceptions. So, um, um, yes, so that's in terms of this. Uh, in terms of the bid levels, uh, so on the left, uh, in the yellow column, we have the bid levels that we uh, that were actually achieved and then on the right uh, we have first the bid levels that we uh, calculate um, uh, as our baseline uh, that, that's the first graph that i showed you uh, and then also uh, on the right we have the bid levels from that waterfall graph that i showed you as well so one interesting thing to here would be to look at uh, Greece and onshore wind. So actually in our baseline values, we miss the uh, actual um, bid level that was achieved in Greece. But when we then uh, do the waterfall model, and when we actually uh, uh, gradually improve first the financing conditions and then the other conditions, uh, which includes lowering CAPEX by 10% from the average that we take, and increasing the capacity factor by 10% and also lowering the ONM by 10%, we actually get to the level that was actually achieved in Greece, which is an interesting finding because it actually tells us that in order to uh, win an option, uh, you actually need to then have obviously uh, the best uh, possible project. And um, for these other countries, you can see that we lie somehow within the actual ranges that were achieved. Um, so, so regarding the conclusions and the discussion, so um, the largest, uh, since, since debt risking achieves the largest benefit, uh, it implies that uh, we should focus on revenue stabilization and, in, and actually have um, mechanisms like the two-sided CFD that stabilizes revenues. However, uh, in our cross-country study, we do not really find evidence that countries that have uh, CFDs, two-sided CFDs, have lower cost of capital. And instead, actually, um, we believe that when you look at the cross-country comparison, country risk is the main driver of risk. Uh, so for instance, you can look at the uh, difference between Greece and Denmark. Although Greece has a two-sided contract for difference, it has a 2.7% higher VAC than uh, Denmark on average. And Denmark has a fixed premium, which is completely exposed to exposed projects to electricity markets. Um, the de risking cost of equity has a lesser impact. So um, in terms of when you discuss the risking, you could think, OK, well, if I have an auction scheme, then maybe I can uh, you know, uh, reduce the bid bond a little bit, or I can uh, prolong the realization rate or not require projects. 
to have a building permit or stuff like that. Uh, but actually we find that even if that would have an effect on cost of equity, which probably wouldn't, but even if policymakers did it, it wouldn't have a big impact in terms of cost effectiveness. So they should do this mainly if they have other um, agendas in mind, such as for instance, favoring special actors. But of course, then here they have to be very, very careful how they do this. Um, and also, and finally, other market conditions have a very large impact on support costs, such as site conditions, technology costs, and electricity price expectations. Uh, so um, actually, uh, this implies that basically even just uh, development in the capex or the lowering of the capex costs could have a large impact on support costs and also the development of the electricity price, which is something that you know we should um, we should be aware of when we talk about these things. Uh, okay, so uh, that was uh, from me, and I am happy to take your questions and remarks and. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Max, for a really nice and clear presentation. Well in time. We now have some time for, for discussion. Are there any questions from the audience? You may use the chat or the mic. Let me start with the first question about the, the title, uh, the general topic, de-risking. Yes. The risk is not a way, it always exists. So what do you mean? Uh, how do you feel this? It's not more about shifting risk to other participants because the, 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 the source of risk is not a way. Um, could you uh, clarify the question? I didn't understand it completely. The risking is that it reduces the risk, but the risk on a more general level still exists. Mm -hmm. Okay. And regarding electricity price, the general economic conditions, weather conditions, what you do with finance construction is shifting the risk away to other players. Yeah, exactly. So it would be, um, um, that is exactly true. So we can take the example of the electricity markets. Electricity markets, they are volatile. Um, and basically, uh, who takes the risk here? Well, the government takes the risk. So actually, uh, when we talk about the risking, that would be, let's say, this revenue stabilization. So a government comes in and says, we want a quantum for difference. And this then basically takes away the risk of uh, price volatility from the market actors. Um, so the risk is still there, but somebody takes it. And yeah. um, that's, uh, that is completely true. And the same would be, for instance, um, if uh, you decide, uh, let's say, in an auction scheme, not to have, uh, not, not require uh, bidders to have a building permit, which then reduces the risk of some costs, because if they lose an auction, they might, you know, lose the, the funds invested in it. Uh, here again, um, risk is shifted. But um, yeah, so the risking would equal uh, kind of the government soaking up all of the yeah. risk. I guess helps the investor. But then if the issue is the risk uh, just remains, but you are shifting the risk to someone else, then it's really important to have proper assessment of the risk level. And then I have a question about your input values. Yes. How, uh, how did you, to what extent are the internal values within a scenario consistent, internally consistent? So you, you made a bad, a worse scenario and a bad scenario. Okay. Just about uh, uh, based on the extreme values coming from the surveys. But how do you know that these scenarios are internally consistent, really referring to actual potential uh, circumstances? Yeah, well, um, we cannot know that uh, for sure, obviously. Uh, so um, we have the data set that we use, it's a limited data set. Um, we, it would be better to, you know, uh, increase the number of inputs, especially for some countries for which we have low inputs. So, um, so actually, uh, we we cannot know that for sure. Uh, so, and that's also a limitation of the study. So maybe 
actually the you know the de-risking that we talk about yes fine but what if for instance uh you know the lowest uh cost of debt that we collected in a country was from a company that is a complete outlier uh, like for instance uh Erstel in denmark or, or whatever who have very low cost of debt then you know like would it mean that uh you know the risking would really reduce these support costs by such an extent for everybody uh you know it probably in such a case it wouldn't so um the data set and the data input has definitely this limitation yeah maybe this idea for further research huh, to check the internal consistency yes definitely yeah it would be definitely uh, in a need of a follow-up and also a building up upon this. Um, and as I said, um, it would probably be a better idea to do it for a lower number of countries, which, like focus, let's say, just on five countries and then do for each country many, many, many estimates yeah. than to do it for the entire European Union. Um, but um, I have to say yeah. as a disclaimer, this is because of the nature of this project, which was yeah. for okay. the entire European Union yeah. and the funding required that we collected for the entire European yeah. Union. So I uh, actually, yeah. if, if yeah. I would design this, I wouldn't design it like this, but you know, it yeah. was okay. <laughs> simply like that. You yeah, have a time for a really brief final question, if there is anyone. Yes, I'd have a question. If that's Hi, okay. Florian. Hi. Hi, Mark, nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you too. <laughs> Please, uh, brief. Brief. I mean, congrats on a great presentation. Um, I have two questions. One is on this on this scatter plot that you showed, where you showed yes. that there is basically no correlation between WEC and support costs. And mm -hmm. you mentioned Germany. Um, so I was wondering how much that actually depends on your assumption of how you calculate capture prices. Uh, maybe you could comment on that. And the second one, and if you don't have time, then don't answer it. Um, the second one is on your last um, table. And it seems that you're kind of overshooting if you compare it to the actual auction prices. And I was wondering what your intuition is behind that, why that's the case. Yes, this one. Yeah, uh, okay. So that is that would be in case of Germany, you mean uh, in, the, in this uh, low baseline and high baseline column, that's what you mean? No, I mean, these, are, these questions are separate. So the first question, I just used Germany as an illustration. I was wondering like, is that the fact that you see such a wide variance, is it actually due to how you calculate capture prices into the future? You mentioned um, Leon Hirt's paper. Um, and the second one is not related to that. It's just in general, like it seems that your results are higher than the actually observed auction bits. And I was wondering what your intuition is, why this is the case. Yes. Yeah, so this could be because, uh, I mean, it could be obviously because of the assumptions that we take to calculate the capture prices, but actually um, the assumptions are relatively similar across uh, all of the countries. How we calculated the capture prices is basically we did a review of the national energy and climate plans uh, to know the um, penetration rate of wind and solar in uh, 2030. And then we used that as a 2030 point. And then for 2018 or 2019, we used the current uh, penetration rate. And then basically based on this, we calculated, uh, you know, what would be a market value factor now, whereas uh, in comparison to the future, which obviously omits many different things. It omits uh, the penetration of uh, electric vehicles, the, all, all the other things that will happen uh, on the grid. So uh, it's obviously a huge, you know, simplification um, and it, it could also imply that um, you know we do not um, necessarily calculate this entirely correctly but actually uh, what we did what we did and I didn't show it here is we compare these capture prices that we have with other studies and they are actually relatively similar even if you take this simplistic approach um, uh, in terms of uh, the bid levels, in this baseline value, the overshoot could be uh, because the data that we use is not, um, you know, um, perhaps entirely correct or up to date. Uh, we use uh, for our baseline investment data, mainly we rely on the IRENA cost database uh, and also some internal Wind Europe numbers. Uh, and uh, for capacity factors, we rely on a um, EU wide. Uh, 
a project that mapped uh, available sites and uh, capacity factor on the available sites, which maybe is also not uh, entirely correct. And perhaps also, um, as I said, is not a representation of the projects that then actually win in auctions, because maybe the projects that actually win in auctions are not the ones that have the average sites, but the one that have the better than average sites which is why we overshoot probably in our baseline values. But as you okay. can see, when we yeah. when we actually go down here, uh, if you look at Germany here, it's not so big, but when we go down with the capacity factors and everything, we actually, you know, go down a lot in terms of the, in terms of the bid level and this best level then ends up actually at 48. So it's on the levels that we saw in the auction rounds in 2017, 18. Uh, so, um, yes, you know, like the difficulty with this is that you're not in the shoes of the investor who has very specific conditions and, um, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks yeah. a lot, sir. Mark. Unfortunately, we have to end this uh, part of the session. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Thanks for your question, Florian. Yes. Thank thanks, you. Florian. Um, so let's move on to okay. the second uh, speaker uh, with uh, Anselm Eike. Anselm will talk about the locational instruments in sonal electricity markets, which is also a really relevant and topical issue. Anselm, the floor is yours. Max 25 minutes. Sorry for that. I think I need to unmute before I share my screen. Uh, oh, I don't know why. Okay. Uh, but now you can hear me, I hope. We can hear you. Yes, indeed. And you should see my slides in full screen. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to speak about the cost optimal placement of generation in a zonal electricity market. And I'm presenting a bi-level model um, of location specific network charges uh, to you. Um, and to give you perhaps some background and, and the framework, make it clear, I have here a very schematic plot um, that is obviously uh, strongly simplified, but um, it reflects reality in, in many countries. Um, often sites with the lowest generation costs um, do not coincide, coincide with sites that are close to demand. So in, in Germany, for example, you have lots of cheap wind generation in Northern Germany and most consumption is located in the South. Um, therefore, um, in this graph, it would be reflected as on the left-hand side, you have sites with uh, high generation costs, the dark blue line, and rather no uh, low network cost, that would be Southern Germany. So if you build wind in Southern Germany, you pay a lot for generation, but less for network. And on the right-hand side, that would be Northern Germany, you pay a lot for, for network investment, but the generation is, is much cheaper. And similar cases arise in other countries as well, just to mention one uh, in the UK, you have similar case uh, in Scotland is windy in, in London and around London, you have most electricity consumption. So that's, that's a pattern we find in many places. Um, and from the investor's perspective, uh, there is often no, no incentive to go to a location where the combined cost of network and generation is lower. And in this very simple example, it would be somewhere in the middle uh, where you have lower network costs but high, uh, and slightly higher generation costs and the total cost is, is lowest then. Um, but in practice, if you have a zonal electricity market, there is often no incentive to do so because network costs are usually socialized, not paid by generators, but by consumers. Um, so the private optimum for, for, for investors differs from the social optimum. And one approach to address this is to introduce locational signals. And these locational signals can come in, in different forms. Um, you can introduce them in renewable support schemes uh, if it's specifically targeted as renewable at renewables, but you could also introduce something like grid usage charges, um, or if you have a capacity mechanism um, that could also be, different, be differentiated between locations. Um, and um, uh, independent of, of which instrument you choose to, to convey the signal, um, you need to figure out how strong is the signal. So how much is the, the value difference of generation between two locations um, that should be imposed on, on generators. And uh, this is what I'm going to address in this, in this contribution here. Um, so on the one hand side, I ask myself, what's the, the welfare 
maximizing or cost minimal distribution of generation capacity in a zonal market. And, and the second part of the research question is then how to determine the, the locational signal that then leads to this distribution. And it's a bit difficult to calculate that because in a zonal system model, um, you cannot account for network cost because uh, there is no network included in the zonal model. And if you have a nodal system model, what most, most people use to determine the optimal location, then you have a, another problem because a, zonal, a nodal model assumes that the dispatch is also um, nodal. So at some, at some locations, demand may react to lower prices or higher prices, but prices differ between uh, over the system, which is the case in a, in a zonal market. So both types of model do not really work here to model the behavior of a generator in a zonal market that somehow accounts for, um, for differences in, in network costs. And um, I here would like to present two different perspectives on, 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 this, on this issue. And the one perspective is the internalization of network costs. So in theory, if you internalize all network costs, so if you make generators pay for the additional transmission lines they cause, um, then this they would reflect that in their investment decisions and, and thereby choose the, the cost optimal siting from system perspective. And this is also what, what's done in, in some countries where you have location specific network charges that if you build a new transmission line, you figure out, well, who is benefiting from this additional transmission line, which generator, sometimes also which consumer benefits from it. And then you distribute the cost of the new transmission line among these people who benefit um, in relative shares. Um, this approach may be applicable and uh, viable in practice, but it's, it's hard to implement that in a power system model. And I'm taking a different approach. Uh, and the approach I'm, I'm taking is I'm um, thinking about the signal that, that I need to have to then reach a, a distribution of generation, which is welfare optimal. And in, in theory, both, um, both approaches should lead, lead to the same results. So either I internalize costs and then get to the same, to the optimal distribution, or I, I figure out the optimal signal or the signal that leads to the optimal distribution. And I'm going for the second approach, which, uh, which is here on the right-hand side, um, which allows to estimate uh, such a signal for all locations and for all technologies in a single model. Um, and how do I do that? Um, this is one slide on, on the methodology and on the model itself. Um, it's a, a bi-level model. So it's, it's two levels. It's a leader and a follower, also a Stackelberg game. Um, and the leader, which is in this case, the outer box, the regulator, decides on a locational signal uh, with the aim of minimizing the total cost. And the inner problem is the generator that decides based on the signal that's given from the outer problem. So it's fixed in the inner problem, um, which is the optimal location for new gener generation investment and what's the optimal dispatch of this generation assuming a zonal market. So in the inner problem, I don't account for transmission capacity and transmission lines. And in the outer problem, I do account for the additional transmission costs and redispatch cost. And mathematically, uh, this is an MPEG model and which can be solved by um, representing the inner problem in its KKD, KKT conditions, and then inserting the KKT conditions of the inner problem into the um, optimization problem of the outer problem. Uh, which would then give you the, if, if it solves, it gives you the optimal um, signals um, for, for generation investment. Uh, so uh, in the calculation of the signals, you account for the network and in the dispatch uh, and investment, you do not account for the network, but only for the signals that, that were given uh, from the other problem. Um, and to give you just an example of, of what that means, um, I have a very simple model 
um, with two locations. So think again of, of Germany if you want. Um, so it's a northern location, a southern location uh, with limited transmission capacity in between. And um, I plotted the, some schematic supply and demand curves. And in the north, you have a, a lower demand for electricity, the blue line, and a cheaper supply. Um, that's, for example, due to a higher renewable potential. And in the southern location, you have a um, more expensive electricity supply, but also a higher willingness to pay for electricity and the higher electricity demand in the south. And um, if you take these two nodes and consider them as a joint market, a zonal market, uh, you get to the merit order curve that I showed on the left-hand side. Um, which combines these two supply and demand curves for north and south. And if this is a uniform market, you get one electricity price uh, that arises at the intersection of supply and demand. Um, and uh, because this is then not possible to be dispatched because of the limited transmission capacity, um, you need to redispatch afterwards. And in this example, there is only very limited transmission capacity, the, the, the small bit in the upper part in the north where I plotted red, that's, that's possible to transmit to the south where the demand is, demand is located. And most other generation need to be curtailed. And then you need upward redispatch in the south to compensate for the curtailment in the north. And obviously, this is a very strong example case where you have lots of redispatch. Um, and uh, probably, if transmission line is not too expensive, you would rather uh, invest in more transmission line. Um, but in practice, you will always remain with some, some redispatch usually because transmission line is then too expensive. expensive. Um, and what can a locational signal do? Well, in this very simple example, you could increase the cost uh, in the north, for example, through an additional charge on generation in the north, for example, a network charge or a grid connection charge and reduce costs in the south um, via a negative charge, which is also applied in some countries. So if, for example, in the UK, you have a negative charge for being connected to the power system in London. So if you generate in London, you get money for being connected uh, to the system. And um, the way I calculate the signal, these price signals, is that the sum of, of the signals is, is zero. So it's a revenue neutral. So the gray shaded areas in North and South are the same. Um, so there is no, uh, it's, it's cost neutral. And this, this additional signal would then lead to a scenario where um, the only some generation is located in the north, more generation is located in the south, and there is no need for redispatch in this, in this very simple example of, of one single time step. Um, and due to the additional signal, you get a slightly higher market price. Um, and a and different behavior of demand also because, because the price is higher. This is just to give you an intuition of, of how such a locational signal could work. So it's shifting generation from one area to another because um, the signal reflects the additional network costs. Uh, of course, this example was very simplistic. Um, it was a sing single time step. Therefore, there was no, no time patterns in the availability of, of energy supply. Uh, also no time patterns in the, in the generation cost. Um, there was no differentiation between investment and operation cost because it was only one single time step. And um, in this case, the location instrument can uh, eliminate the need for redispatch because it, it moves generation just that there is no need for redispatch anymore because it's only one, one hour. Um, also, I fixed the network capacity in this example. And you could also think about a, a, a long-term model where you allow for network investment as well. And that's what I'm going to do in the second example, which I'm going to present now, where I apply the model on a, on a bit more advanced. It's not a whole power system model because I was, I was limited to the, to the solver, Conopt, um, which could only solve, uh, because I don't have a license at the moment, uh, which can only solve 20, 20 hours um, of this model. But I included four different technologies with generation and investment costs. Um, these 20 time steps I was able to calculate. I have different 
availability profiles of renewables. So wind in the north is different from wind in the south, but there is some correlation. Um, these are some hours taken from real data, and I selected these hours such that um, the capacity factors of wind and solar reflect more or less what's what you can expect for Germany. So. Uh, wind generation has higher capacity in northern Germany than in southern Germany, and solar is slightly higher in southern Germany than in, in northern Germany. And you see that these time series are correlated with each other, um, and there are some typical patterns. So, for example, the solar time series has, has hours without generation because that's nighttime. Um, and I also accounted for difference in electricity demand by using the same profile for electricity demand, but assuming at twice as high electricity demand in south southern Germany compared to northern Germany. So it's scaled by a factor of two. Um, and I also included what we have seen in the first in the first example, an upward slope in the uh, supply curve. So um, I give an additional penalty on investment cost, uh, the more capacity you install in each location. So for example, if you install wind in a location, then you have cheap investment cost at the beginning, but the more wind you install, the more expensive it will get because you get less attractive sites. And to reflect that, I have a small uh, adder on, on the investment cost. And I allow for energy and network investment. And um, I admit that this is a very simple model, but it gives some, some hints at what these locational signals could, could lead to, and therefore I compare three scenarios. A reference scenario, with, which is just a zonal electricity market without locational signal, then a zonal electricity market with a locational signal, and as a upper benchmark, a nodal model, um, which would be the ideal solution where you have a, a dispatch according to the nodal prices and investment as well according to nodal prices which is obviously the best, best case. Um, but if you want to stick to a zonal market, um, then this example at least hints at, at a strong benefit of some additional locational signals because the welfare in, in, this, in this scenario with uh, locational instruments is about 9% higher compared to the reference case. And the upper benchmark, the nodal model is about 10% best, better than the zonal model which is also what many studies find for Germany, that this is about the order of magnitude that you can expect as efficiency gain from, from a nodal market, ideally. Um, so in theory, such locational sig signals can get pretty close to the nodal benchmark, although the dispatch is then still a zonal dispatch. Um, and this, this hints at, at, the, at the thought that um, the investment signal is quite significant and quite important, and the dispatch signal is, is less, less important than the investment signal if investment is correctly cited, which is currently not the case. Um, and also another result, which is not surprising, but the locational signal reduces the network cost by about 90% compared to the reference scenario, but leads to high, slightly higher generation costs of, of about 3%, uh, but generation costs are in, in total much higher than network costs. Um, and that's also intuitive because I, I replace some generation from north to south to, to the locations that are less beneficial, uh, less profitable. Generation is more expensive, but therefore, I, thereby, I save some, some network cost. Um, and this is the second of three slides on the results. Um, here, I show the, the calculated signals. So in the in middle two columns, you see the signals calculated for the uh, for the four technologies for north and south so you can see that onshore wind in the north features an additional charge for being connected to the grid so it's about 30 uh, 37 euro per megawatt per those 20 hours more expensive and i compare that to the annualized investment cost of onshore wind for the 20 hours so it's a uh, small number, it's 215 uh, euro per, me per megawatt per 20 hours. Um, so it's about a 17% increase in the cost for onshore wind in the north, but a slight decrease of 4% in the south. So the signal here 
um, indicates that wind generation in northern Germany has some quite significant network costs. And these network costs also arise for solar and south because there is mostly solar generation in, in the south and not in the north, um, but it's much smaller because uh, more demand is located in the south and the, the problem is, is less significant there. And you can also see a slight shift of, of conventional generation. So there is a, a higher penalty. Um, that's probably wrong. Um, there, there was a higher penalty in the north on, on combined cycle gas turbines than in the south. I think I, I copy pasted the, the figures wrongly here for, for combined cycle gas turbines. Sorry for that. Um, but one interesting takeaway here is that, uh, that the model calculates different um, instruments, not only per location, but also per technology, which totally makes sense because depending on my generation profile, um, I use the transmission grid to a different extent. And some profiles are much more problematic for the transmission grid than others. And this is what makes these transmission um, network costs difficult to calculate or the responsibility of network costs difficult to calculate. Um, and here we see that if you really aim at internalizing network costs, then the signal must be different for different technologies. And this is not the case in, in most countries that apply, uh, that apply some form of location instruments there. It's usually the same for conventional and renewable generation and for different types of renewable generations. Um, and he can show that this is, this is probably only a simplified approach and maybe pretty, pretty wrong. And last slide on the, on the results. Uh, what you can see here is the installed capacity and the share of renewables in generation uh, for the three different scenarios. And you can see that the uh, location instrument increases the share of renewables uh, of generation. So not of capacity, but of generation. Um, one, one strong argument for this is obviously that there is less redispatch and redispatch implies it's curtailment of onshore wind in Northern Germany and then upward redispatch in Southern Germany with fossil generation. Um, and because we have less redispatch uh, due to the signal because of a better siting of, of, of investment, um, this increased the renewable share um, and it gets nearly as high as in the market. Um, which also implies that introducing such a location and signal, which may also shift conventional generation from, from areas where you have high potential for renewables, but less, for, less so for uh, the less demand, uh, may also help renewables. So a location and signal for conventional generation uh, may also benefit renewables because then they can use up more of the grid. So an example would be um, Scotland, where you have a quite a high um, network charge for conventional generation in, in, in Scotland. And therefore the Scottish coal power plants were the first to shut down and, and the ones in, in Southern England remained open longer because of this locational signal. And that totally makes sense because then the coal power plants in Northern Scotland don't use up the transmission capacity from Northern, from Scotland to England. Um, so to sum up what I, what I just presented, um, I would say, in this, in this paper I'm going to write, I'm writing, um, I have two contributions. One is the methodology. Um, I present a novel approach to um, account for the inter interaction of regulatory interventions, such as locational network charges in a zonal power market with a zonal, re with a zonal dispatch and formulated this as a, as a bi-level model, which can be helpful to further investigate locational instruments in specific jurisdictions uh, with such a model. And um, from very basic and simple examples, you can get some, some first insights on locational and locational instruments. Um, so one was that the, those locational signals um, should differ between location and between technologies, which is not always the case, uh, case in practice. Um, and I find quite a significant welfare gain of these locational signals in the exam. And obviously, if you have a more Nash network, 
you will have a less less important benefit of of such location signals. And perhaps as a last aspect, just to have mentioned, um, nodal, nodal prices arise from the market, so there is regulatory intervention necessary. If you calculate such locational price signals as a regulator, you will obviously do it wrong in some form. Um, and what I calculated here is, is the benefit of optimal locational price signals. So if you are able to calculate these price signals cost optimally, um, then you can achieve quite some significant welfare benefits. Uh, but what I calculated here is only an upper bound. And in reality, I expect that this, this will not be as perfect because you, for calculating these sig signals, you need to have perfect information on on availability, on, on cost differences between technologies and locations. And uh, that's it from my side. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Ansel, for this really interesting uh, presentation. Now we're going to have some time for discussion. Is there anyone who wants to raise a question by chat or preferably by using the mic? Can you show the previous slide, Ansel? Just mm -hmm. This can inspire people to formulate their questions. Sure. <laughs> Although on the last slide was a reference to our last paper on location oh. instruments. So if you're interested, okay. that was interesting as well. But yeah, find yeah. the internet as well. Yeah. I think there's a question from Clément. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering uh, whether or not you've considered investigating the dynamics of this locational signal, meaning like Maybe after some time, after setting these signals, you might want to update it later once new capacity have been built and how this would behave regarding to like compared to the optimal nodal pricing benchmark. Do you have any insight on that? Is it um, relevant in your opinion? I think it's definitely relevant to update location and signals, but there's a trade off. If I up like the signal is is meant to incentivize the sighting of new generation. And if you check the signal every five days, then no investor will account for this additional signal because he knows or she knows it will change anyways. So why, do, why should I account for it? So in, ideally, you have such a signal for quite some time so that investors can adapt to the signal and react on it and then place or uh, make their sighting decisions based on the signal. Um, but a signal that's time, time constant would not reflect the change, changing patterns of, of generation and also of the transmission grid. So every time you build some new generation, the signal will be updated as well, or should be updated if it's properly reflecting network costs. So there's a trade-off. Either you update it all the time, so it's always, always the perfect signal, but then it doesn't really help for investors to take investment decisions or you never update it, then you have it perfect at the beginning, but thereafter it's, it's just not reflecting reality anymore. Um, and a bit the same issue arises from nodal prices because nodal prices change when you install a new generation. So if I'm basing my investment decision on high nodal prices in one area, but then somebody else invests in this area as well, prices may decline and, and the incentive for me to go to this area is not as strong anymore. And if I can't foresee that, then it's, it's a problem for my investment decision. So um, in both cases, there is this trade-off and there is no ideal solution to address this trade-off, I would say. Did this answer your question? Yeah, 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 totally. Thank you. But uh, going further on this issue, so why is it not an ideal situation to have a, a signal which varies according to the changing uh, marginal cost of and the changing shadow price of network extension? Because in theory, the price should reflect the, the marginal cost. So if you have a nodal market, like if you have a zonal market, then there is no price like this. That is clear. Oh. But in, in theory, what would be the best? Would it, would it be the best that all network users always see the cost of what they are doing? Yes, that would be the best. But and if these costs like change if, from time to time, then they also the, the signals should should change as well. Yes, like in, in theory, the signal should change, but then it's difficult for investors to adapt. That was the argument from beforehand. Um, yeah. 
and calculating the margin of the shadow price at a specific location is only possible in a nodal power system model. And that would be another approach to, to this problem. But um, the, the dispatch, like that you would assume that the dispatch is also as in the nodal power system model. But in reality, if you have a zonal market, then the dispatch is, is just different from the, the nodal yeah. dispatch. And therefore the shadow price from the nodal model is not the right one to reflect the shadow price of generation in a zonal market. So I'm trying to combine both models, yeah. but, but one model alone is, is insufficient to account for network costs on the one hand, and on the other hand, also for, uh, for the behavior of, on, of investors and generators in a zonal market that just doesn't work together. And I'm trying to bring this together through this locational instrument, and therefore I need this bi-level optimization formulation, which makes yeah. it much more complicated. But I think that's the only way to go around this problem of, I'd like to account for network costs, but generators do not account for network costs in their, in their dispatch and investment decisions. No. Okay, anyone else who wants to ask a question? I see that Christina has raised her hand as well. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting paper. I, I liked a lot. And um, maybe I'm focusing on something that is um, that deviates somehow of your paper. But uh, have you thought um, of including or analyzing independently interconnections? Because uh, I think that um, in your zonal market or situation, you are focusing uh, on a situation within a country, mm -hmm. right? Different mm -hmm. zones within a country. But in the case of Germany, for instance, which is a country with a high level of interconnections because of the geography and because of them, it's not like Spain, for instance, like we are an island in, in energy terms. But uh, I think that maybe um, including um, interconnections could be interesting. Um, because also in terms of regulation, uh, they are going to have an important role in the energy union uh, in, in, in the future, in the, near, in the near future in Europe. So what do you think about it? I think it's a totally valid point and it's a very good one. Um, it's a bit difficult because um, that's, that it's coming a, getting a political question whether you want to shift generation from one country to another so not every country is, or some countries are going to become net importers, others are going to become net exporters. Um, and this is probably from an economic perspective make, makes totally sense from a political perspective. I'm not sure whether this will work or not. Um, and therefore I, and also for simplicity, I focused on a single country first and perhaps this applies more to something like, like the UK where you have already some, some charges like this, but they're complicated, compli uh, calculated, compli complicated. And this is perhaps more a methodological approach on, on what would be the benefit of such, such instruments. But it's, I would totally agree that it becomes more complicated, for example, if you have a, a high network charge for wind generation in northern Germany, but no network charge in, in southern Denmark, then there would be a strange effect at the border where people would say, well, I always build my wind farm in, in southern Germany, Denmark and not in northern Germany, but from the grid perspective, it's, it's more or less the same. Um, so there is definitely some limitations in a highly interconnected system like Europe. Um, and I totally agree that this is a shortcoming. Um, perhaps it makes also sense, it still makes sense to steer generation investment within the country but the effect with neighboring countries has, limit, has limitations on how high you can make such signals within a country. Yeah, no, thank you. I don't think this is an issue for, for your paper and your contribution, but it's just, I'm personally interested in that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's a valid Thank point. you very Thanks. much. As a final question, Anselm, how do you see the risk that regulators set the wrong signal resulting in uh, yeah, distorted investment decisions and um, but I think there is a risk, but at the moment, it's kind of the regulator sends no in signal for investment decisions at the moment, because there is no difference between yeah. different locations within a country. And to be more wrong than that is 
from my perspective, quite unlikely. So I, I'm pretty sure that the, that the regulator will send wrong signals, but I guess it's not as wrong as it is at okay. the moment. So it's an improvement. Always an improvement. Uh, I, that's, that's what I think. Yeah. But yeah, there, there may be counter examples. Yeah. Okay. Mind you. You have to answer, unfortunately, Ansel. Thanks a lot for your excellent presentation. Thanks for the questions. Uh, let's now move on to the third. Thank you very much. Christina Pizarro Irizar will present about an option analysis of re renewable support uh, mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have 25 minutes. Yep. Yeah. I'm yes. sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see. Please. Okay, perfect. Great. So I'm starting. Um, I'm Cristina Pizarro. I'm assistant professor at the University of the Basque Country and associate researcher at the Basque Center of Climate Change. My co-authors in this uh, work are Maripaz Espinosa, full professor at the same university as me, and Andrea Giralt, which is analyst at Sabadell Bank. I would like to mention that this is our first um, work um, working with finance. Uh, we have been dealing with incentive schemes for years, but um, now we move to this uh, financial world and this is a very preliminary work. So you will notice that the results section is still very uh, scarce and any comment, suggestion, criticism is uh, very welcome. Please uh, be ahead, go ahead. So um, in this paper, we are going to work with incentives. So the motivation behind our analysis is uh, are the incentive schemes. We are going to focus on two of the main incentive schemes that are um, nowadays uh, active worldwide. Of course, there are many others such as uh, premiums, um, uh, um, green certificates, uh, tax exemptions, but we are not going to, to talk and analyze them. We are going to focus on feed-in tariffs, which uh, have been uh, reused worldwide, and they are still used in many countries because they have been effective, very effective in uh, achieving higher levels of renewable capacity installed. Um, in the case of Spain, they were the main instrument uh, <clears throat> during uh, 10 years. And most of the renewable capacity that we have installed in the country was um, driven by feeding tariffs. However, the economic efficiency of this instrument has uh, been put into question in, in many papers and also um, by regulators in many countries, Spain is one of them, um, because um, the economic burden that they imposed on the system and finally on consumers was very high. In the case of Spain, uh, precisely, the deficit uh, of the electricity system increased up to 30,000 million euros, uh, the accumulated deficit in 2013 in Spain. And one of the main um, sources of this uh, increased deficit were the incentives to renewables and more precisely the feeding tariff scheme. Because in the very beginning, the design was not correct, the tariffs were overpaid, and the installed capacity in the country was very, very little in the very beginning. So, um, and the learning by doing um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the renewable sector, particularly in the solar sector, uh, allowed a, a very reduced uh, cost uh, in installing solar cells, and the feeding tariff uh, scheme uh, didn't reflect that reduction in cost. So it imposed a great system. So many countries, this is the game of Spain particularly, abandoned this system and um, started um, remunerating uh, renewable capacity uh, by other schemes such as uh, capacity auctions. And in many auction systems, this is the case of Spain, uh, we have a um, complementary uh, incentive scheme, which is based on what the regulator calls a reasonable rate of return on rate of return on the investment. Um, we in this paper we name it the rate of return regulation, and we are going to focus on these two uh, regulatory systems because, according to the International Energy Agency, in the near future, for the next five years, most of the global um, new capacity, particularly for wind power, is expected to be supported with these two systems. Forty percent at the global level. I'm talking now, uh, considering uh, or under the feed-in tariff scheme, and 35 percent under the um, the auction scheme. So despite there are a lot of papers focusing on incentive schemes, there's still um, uh, uh, room for more analysis on the design cost and risk, which we are doing this in this case, we are focusing on risks of the incentive schemes. So the presentation will, will have the regular uh, outline with introduction, methodology, data, results, and conclusions. 
And uh, concerning the introduction, uh, we are dealing with renewable sources, we are dealing with incentives, because we think that uh, the drivers uh, on renewable capacity installment uh, for investors, for producers, are the incentive-based regulatory schemes. Yeah, renewable sources are still uh, not um, prepared to compete in the market uh, freely, uh, not uh, many of them at least, and because of that, uh, we have to rely on these uh, regulatory schemes, uh, feeding tariffs, regulatory regulations, when certificate, etc. And renewable sources, um, in the case of electricity markets, uh, have uh, very important and very particular drawbacks. High capital costs, they have also high investment risk and uh, uncertainty in the returns. So risk and uncertainty are very important words when we are dealing with renewable sources. We can talk about uncertainty at the level of prices. We have uh, price uncertainty, electricity market price uncertainty because of the fossil fuel price volatility, because of CO2 prices, uh, because of renewable sources itself. Also, we can have uncertain results uh, because of the regulation, uh, regulatory structure, regulations change, even uh, sometimes with retroactive measures, as it, as it happened in Spain in 2013. Uh, and uh, that provides instability for investors. And we can also have uh, uncertain returns because of the uh, intermittent nature of many renewable sources, such as wind or solar, for instance. So volatility is an issue uh, for renewable investments. And because of that, um, there are a lot of studies analyzing policy, policy benefit evaluation relating the um, effectiveness of the incentive schemes uh, with, um, with the risk that uh, volatility entails. And uh, one of these uh, methodologies, um, because there are many, uh, is option pricing. And why option pricing could be uh, adequate for this kind of analysis is because it's one methodology that has the potential to evaluate risk mitigations for investors, uh, including uncertainty and the flexibility that we need when we are dealing with renewable sources that other methodologies um, don't, uh, don't have. Uh, in the literature, there are many papers uh, considering real options in electricity markets, and some of them considering real options for evaluating the incentive schemes. We here name three of them. Uh, in the first one that we name, um, we highlight the work by Boomsma et al. They, uh, with a focus on capacity, they analyzed for the Nordic countries uh, and compared two different incentive schemes, feeding tariffs and green certificates in that case, uh, analyzing the effects in policy risk of those uh, incentive schemes. Uh, URL uh, focused on Spain, as we do, uh, but with a different perspective. They use uh, compound real options and they work exclusively, exclusively with wind power, and they made a real option valuation model to compare the two systems that were enforced at the time in Spain, the feeding tariff system and the feeding premium system, which includes um, the market price plus a fixed premium whereas the feed-in tariff uh, considers a fixed tariff over a long period of time. We are going to talk about this later on. And the last paper, Har and Har, is in talking about methodologies the more similar compared to our paper. They use uh, the Black and Scholes formula uh, with a focus on capacity, and they compare um, for different European countries uh, the feeding tariff schemes, um, considering them as uh, options, as financial options, and they uh, analyze the economic efficiency of, uh, of these uh, schemes by looking at the return to investors. A research question. So what are we going to do in this paper? What are we trying to do? Because as I mentioned, this is still a work in progress. It's not finished at all. We have still a lot of work to do. But we would like to see how much risk could entail uh, the regulatory schemes uh, to promote renewable uh, electricity. Uh, in this case, we are going to focus on two different regulatory schemes, the feeding tariffs and the rate of return regulations. And we want to see the difference between them. And we also like to analyze the role of volatility in this quantified risk. We know what happens when we have high volatilities, risk increase, of course, and we know uh, the sign of the effect. But we would like to know the quantification. We would like to quantify how much value this risk, this avoided risk. So we use option price theory. And uh, what we do is a uh, contribution will be a, a risk mitigation evaluation for these two systems. We quantify exposed. This is very important because, because we use uh, exposed uh, data uh, in to do this analysis. Um, and we would like to um, quantify the, the risk that these regulations take away from renewables and pass on to consumers. 
So when a renewable producer accepts uh, the regulatory scheme because they are voluntary, one, one, producer, uh, one renewable producer can decide between selling the renewable electricity directly in the market and uh, getting the market price or selling the electricity in the market, of course, they have to do so, but instead of getting the market price, they can get the regulatory price. So if they take this voluntary decision of taking the regulatory price, part of the risk uh, that they are facing is passed on to consumers because uh, finally the regulatory costs are going to be transferred, are going to be there is a, a path through of this cost to, to the final bill that end consumers pay. And finally, we want to pay to quantify this value of this avoided risk by regulations. And we want to see if this is different between feeding tariffs and rate of return regulations and when is it higher. So to understand our methodology, the uh, first thing we have to do is to um, make clear which are the differences between these two incentive schemes. They are used to promote renewable uh, capacity, they are used to promote renewable participation in the electricity market, but they are different in nature. The design is completely different. For instance, in the case of feed-in tariffs, they uh, warranty a price, a fixed price for a fixed period of time that usually mm, is uh, 10, 20 years, uh, and provide a stable income flow for, for the investor. So they are paid um, in euros or in monetary units by a megawatt hour of electricity, renewable electricity produced. In the case of return regulation, um, we have a warranted profit over total investment, considering both costs and revenues. So we are talking not about uh, production, but we are talking in this case about a million euros, if we are talking at annual terms, so monetary units. So with feeding tariffs, we have payments over production, whereas with rate of return regulations, we have payments over investment. So there's a slight difference in, in the concept of the two regulations. These two regulations have been uh, enforced in Spain uh, for different periods, uh, feeding tariffs uh, from 2004 until 2013, uh, they were uh, suppressed uh, in 2013 with, retroactively because there were comp uh, compromises with um, renewable investors that uh, took longer, but they were uh, abolished completely. And from uh, 2014 onwards, the new rate of return regulation was enacted and is being enforced. So it's uh, important to mention that both schemes are voluntary. Uh, producers can decide uh, where to be in the free market or under these systems. And uh, because of this, our model can be used to evaluate these investment opportunities on renewable sources uh, in electricity and to estimate uh, the market value if the option to accept the regulation is, is taken. So we use the Black and Scholes uh, formula because traditional methods uh, are not able to take into account those uncertainties and flexibilities that we need um, with renewable projects because of uh, the cost, you know, the drawbacks that we mentioned before that arise in these kind of projects. And when we are dealing with renewable production, an option pricing uh, take these characteristics into account. So what we do is we use this uh, Black and Scholes model to evaluate the two different systems and we interpret them as if they were a put option. Uh, with uh, maturity one year, 12 months. This is the, the scope that we, that we use. And we value the options at the beginning of one year and execute them at the end of the year, which is uh, precisely uh, as uh, the liquidations in the regulatory system in Spain uh, are made. So uh, renewable regulators sell the electricity during the year uh, and get the market price during the year in the, in the wholesale market. And at the end of the year, uh, they uh, make um, uh, the calculations and the corresponding liquidations with the regulator and they get the, the corresponding amount of the regulated system. Now, in the next two slides, we are going to define how we interpret and model the two regulations that we selected as uh, put options. So in the first case, we have the feeding tariff structure, and we mentioned that here we focus on production. So we value the risk of producing one megawatt hour of renewable electricity. And the option price in this case will represent the cost for the buyer's acceptance of the risk. Of the risk. So the, um, the put option will have an exercise price equal to the price of the feeding tariff, and the price of the underlying asset measured also in euros per megawatt hour will be the total income of the producer, of the renewable producer, over the total amount of renewable energy produced during one year. 
So this is so uh, how uh, weighted average price, uh, annual weighted average price. So we work with only data. Here we have the 8,760 uh, observations uh, at an only level annually, and we compute the uh, one single value for one year. In the case of the rate of return regulation, now we are valuing the risk of producing the total amount of megawatt hours of one year of renewable energy. I'm talking about renewable production uh, anytime. And this regulation implies that um, a renewable production unit gets a subsidy that is uh, exactly the same uh, to the operation costs of the plant and uh, a fixed rate of return on capital. But operational costs, uh, which are related to the variable cost of the renewable production, are already covered by the regulation. We are talking about this uh, later on in the data section. So we are going to ignore them to when computing profits, and we are going to consider only the investment uh, costs. So the exposure in this case uh, of these uh, of renewable investors um, can be a hedge again, by obtaining a put option, but with different interpretation. In this case, the uh, exercise price will be uh, equal to the total return on investment in, in monetary units uh, annually, and the price of the underlying asset will be the profit of the uh, renewable producers. So we will consider the income generated in the electricity market, price multiplied by quantity, renewable quantity, and we subtract the variable cost that is covered by this operating cost that the uh, regulatory system uh, pays. So for the data, this uh, exercise is uh, purely empirical, and we are lucky uh, when we focus with uh, Spanish information, with the Spanish data, because we have a lot of freely publicly, publicly available information, very detailed information uh, from different sources um, uh, at an early level, which is uh, very useful for this kind of analysis. So we don't need uh, to estimate anything because we actually have uh, actual data from most, for most of the variables that we use. So we are going to use uh, three different sources of information. The market operator, the Spanish market operator, uh, provides all the information necessary uh, for the day ahead uh, market price. We use prices and aggregate quantities. And we also know how much of this quantity at an aggregate level uh, uh, corresponds to uh, renewable sources. But uh, in the day ahead market, we don't know um, from this total amount of renewable energy produced, we don't know um, which share corresponds to each technology. This is not provided. But we can merge this, uh, this data with the data provided by the Spanish system operator. Um, and then we are able to see for each hour how much quantity uh, corresponds to each renewable technology, how much corresponds to wind, how much corresponds to solar, etc. And then the incentive, incentives that were paid to the renewable uh, structure, uh, both uh, under the feed-in tariff structure and, and the, the rate of return regulations, are also uh, public. And uh, the Spanish Antitrust Authority, the CNMC, is in charge of um, uh, making them available at the end of the year. So uh, we have these three uh, different sources of data, and we analyze uh, for the moment two different years, one year under the feed-in tariff scheme, uh, 2013, and another year under the rate of return regulation. Now we are uh, extending this work to analyze a wider uh, number of years. So if we focus on these two initially selected years, we observe the price structure. Here we represent um, daily prices uh, for, for the two years. We observe that uh, there is a general um, similar trend. Uh, actually, electricity prices are very uh, stationary. Um, they have a very stationary component. We observe that during the first six years of the month, of the six months of the year, uh, prices are generally more volatile and uh, at a lower level, and they increase in the final part of the year. And they became, um, in the case of uh, 2016, is more evident, uh, less volatile. But we observe differences in levels uh, between these two years. Prices were lower in 2016, and uh, volatility was, was higher in 2013. These differences that we observed um, graphically uh, can be um, quantified uh, with the basic descriptive statistics of this time series. And we observe what we expected. We see uh, lower mean and median prices in 2016, but higher uh, volatilities, higher standard deviation in 2013. 
Then we observe also differences uh, comparing the minimum and maximum variables. We reached zero day ahead uh, market prices in 2013 for some days, very few days, but some days. But uh, it was not uh, the case in 2016. And also we observe that maximum prices are much higher in 2013. So this is another of the causes of this high, higher volatility that we observe in 2013. Concerning the comparison of our distributions with a normal distribution, we observe that for both years, our distribution is uh, left-sided. And uh, in the kurtosis component, we observe a change of sign, meaning that one year uh, tails were heavier than in, in the other year compared to, to a normal distribution. So if we observe, uh, according to the data provided by the system operator, the distribution here we represent um, monthly, the monthly distribution of um, each renewable source, we also observe that we have a very similar pattern across years. Hydro production uh, tends to be higher in spring, in May and, and April. Uh, solar production, of course, tends to be higher in summer, in June, July, August. And wind productions tend to be higher in um, late autumn and the early winter months. Concerning the incentives provided by the um, Antitrust Authority in Spain, um, they give us information about the total amount uh, annually paid by the incentive scheme. In the case 2013, it corresponded to the feed-in pre-tariff system and um, almost 9,000 million euros were paid uh, total, including all renewable sources. Um, uh, and we observe differences among technologies. Of course, if we compute um, the unitary incentive uh, by dividing the total uh, regulated incentive in million euros uh, by the total uh, electricity uh, eligible uh, for this system, we get that um, the unitary uh, premium or tariff could have been of uh, 86 euros per megawatt hour. And we observe uh, important differences, huge differences uh, between technologies. Solar uh, producers get uh, much more uh, tar higher tariffs than wind, for instance. When uh, regulation changed and we moved uh, to the uh, rate of return scheme, uh, the way um, the incentives were paid uh, changed. Uh, now the um, regulator pays um, incentives in two uh, independent ways. On the one hand, we have the incentives to investment. Those are the incentives we are going to consider to model our put option. And then we have the incentives to operation, which in the case, for instance, of wind on hydropower, they are related to variable costs of production, uh, are zero. And other technologies are uh, paid um, some, some, some amount that we are going to, to discount in, in our profit function. So um, I think there is very um, uh, stuck in, in, in this case and it's, uh, uh, needs uh, mentioning is the way uh, the amount or total amount of incentives paid uh, to investment with the new regulation was almost half the amount that was paid under the feeding type scheme. So this new system uh, became um, a lot cheaper for the regulators. And actually this was the idea when they approved it, uh, trying to avoid this extra cost that the feeding type scheme has been imposing in the systems over the years. So we here observe that, that effect in the, in the cost, in the regulatory cost. And now, or very briefly, our a few results. Minutes left, uh, yes, yes, because my results are very scarce. So, uh, I will... okay. <laughs> thank okay. you. Uh, we uh, conducted a very um, uh, uh, a volatility analysis in, in to see uh, how much of the volatility uh, that we observe in electricity prices uh, could be due to renewable participation. So here we compare uh, for the pool, actually the electricity prices, and uh, also uh, for the electricity participation below, we observe that uh, the, when the volatility in the pool in electricity prices, here we represent uh, daily price differences computed as uh, the price of price of one day minus the price of the previous day. So we observe that the volatility is higher uh, during the first six months of the year, and it coincides with higher volatility in, in the participation of renewable sources. And it happens the same for 2016 and 2013. We completed another source of uh, volatility analysis, the exponentially weighted moving average, and we reached the same conclusions. So we observed that most part of the volatility in electricity prices could be due to the intermittency of renewable sources, which has an important effect on renewable investments, of course. And now here come the, the results. 
uh, we modeled with this Black and Scholes formula, 2013-2016, and what we got, actually, since I am running out of time, I'm going to go directly to the summary. So uh, here we summarize all the results, and we observe the uh, strike price and the uh, uh, price of these um, uh, of these options of these uh, put options for 2013 and 2016. And if we compute the amount in million euros for one year, we value the the risk hedging with a put option for the year 2013 under the feeding tariff scheme with 4,000 million euros, and in the 2016, 2,000 million euros. If we uh, subtract this, um, uh, the these the, the values yes, of the of the uh, uh, price uh, of the capital and the, the stock, we uh, get uh, this difference almost four thousand million euros in 2013 and one thousand million in 2016. And what is important for us is the value of uh, the eliminated risk. We compute this value of the eliminated risk by subtracting the price of the put option and the price of the of the system uh, of the incentive scheme without considering it as a put option. And we observe that the risk, the cost of the risk, uh, covering for the risk under the feeding tariff structure was uh, more expensive than under the new regulation. But this could be due because of the difference in volatility of the two years. We mentioned before that the volatility in 2013 was much higher than in 2016. So we computed a sort of uh, what we call synthetic put option, considering actual information of 2013, but with the volatility of 2016. So with lower volatility values, it's somehow a, um, a sensitivity analysis. And eliminating these, uh, um, these uh, differences in volatility, the result switched. And we observe in that case that uh, the cost of the risk in the new system, in the rate of return regulation regulatory system, was higher than under the feeding tariff scheme. So now with that we have this result, we see uh, the importance of analyzing uh, more years to see we, um, do a more profound, um, a more deep uh, volatility analysis uh, to see if this uh, result is persistent over time and if we can drive um, a specific conclusion on which of the systems entail higher risk uh, uh, for, for investors. So to conclude, uh, actually the main conclusion is that um, we can see a lot of volatility in the pool due to the intermittency of renewable sources. And we observed that in 2013, the feeding tariff scheme uh, as a support option was more expensive because of this volatility. And eliminating this price volatility, the put became more expensive uh, under the rate of return regulation with higher risk hedging. For further research, we are going to compute individual put options by technology because we have uh, we are developing a methodology to do this to identify uh, at an early level all renewable participation, and we are also analyzing uh, extending the scope of the analysis. Uh, all we are going to consider uh, from the year 2007 onwards because um, it's a very uh, from that year onwards we have the Iberian electricity market uh, integrated and it's more stable in terms of market issues. It doesn't make any sense to to compare previous years, uh, because the structure is under the feeding tariff and return regulation, the market structure is different. And we are going to finish with the last uh, available information. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, thanks a lot, Christina. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> very nice uh, presentation. We do have five minutes for some uh, discussion. Ansel, yeah. please. I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Although I'm not I'm not familiar with the Black and Scholes uh, methodology, but uh, I was just asking myself, yeah. um, you accounted for the difference in volatility, but if I understand you correctly, then you use the historical money that's paid for renewable port as one input variable, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but actually, um, I had that prepared, but I didn't present it. Oh, sorry, because I thought that maybe in the session uh, people were familiar with with this methodology, and I have this as a backup slide. Actually, the Black and Scholes uh, formula that I have here uh, considers. So we are modeling this as a put option, but it's possible to model a call option too. So we have the uh, underlying asset spot price, which is what we uh, computed uh, with the market, and the strike price is what we uh, relate to the regulatory prices. That's it with the feeding tariff price in the first case, and with the total amount paid with the incentives to investment in the rate of return regulation. And volatility is another of the parameters that we have to include in this equation. Yes. Yeah. yes. 
Okay, but then yeah. I'm I'm not entirely sure whether you account for the fact that probably the money the regulator pays for renewables declined over time because renewables are getting cheaper. Is that also uh, reflected in the model? Uh, and no, because um, we are doing this at an at annual level because uh, this is the way uh, in Spain uh, regulate the, uh, the regulator pays to to producers. Mm -hmm. So this is why uh, we want to analyze a wider year, number of years to see this effect. Of course, uh, the total uh, the strike price will be different uh, for the different years because the amount paid by renewables will be different. And we are going to we will be considering this because the strike price is going to be different in any case. Actually, we observe that the strike price in under the feeding tariff scheme was much higher than under the rate of return regulation because mm -hmm. actually the amount paid uh, in incentives was much uh, lower uh, under the new regulatory scheme. So we are considering it about uh, individually when we okay. model this equation year by year. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Or a question. If I understand your results correctly, uh, Christina, then you'll find yeah. if you control for the difference in volatility, that in the case of rate of return regulation, um, it's more risky. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's less risky. Uh, more risky. If we if we control for volatility, the rate of return regulation becomes more risky. Uh, but the value of the avoided risk is higher. Is that, um, that's what you find, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the avoided risk, yeah. The value of the avoided risk is higher. Yes, the value of the avoided risk, yeah, yeah, you're right. Means yes. It's less risky yes. for the investor. Yes, 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 yes that's true. And that yes. makes the avoided sense. Risk. Because in the case uh, of uh, yeah, rate of return regulation, there's no any remaining risk anymore. And there's yes. a guaranteed yes. return on. Yes. Well, in the case of feed interest, there is a remaining risk regarding the production. Yes. That's it. Mm -hmm. and that's why this did make sense. That in that exactly. case, you have a higher. And that's support. why the, the first result didn't make sense. When we didn't control for this volatility change, we got just the opposite result, which, which was strange. Yeah. So, the relevance of considering volatility and the role of volatility here should be, um, we should explore that deeper. Should be yeah. included. But yeah. maybe you should just take the same, all the same uh, circumstances, same data. Yeah. Just as Ansel was referring to, the same yeah. cost, etc. Only yeah. changing the different uh, the, the support scheme, yeah. and then calculates the value of the avoided risk. Yeah, actually, we I didn't mention, but we are planning to do uh, different sensitivity analysis. Yes, including um, many many parameters, many changing many yeah. parameters in the model. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. it would also be nice to include more more type of support schemes. Yeah. As well. that that would be great, but um, uh, we are lucky with this data that uh, we have a lot of information here, and we would also like yeah. to do this for other countries. But getting data is not that easy at an early level with uh, such a detailed. Um, yeah, uh, but maybe. Yeah. yeah. But yes, yes. On. But just if you want to learn more about the differences yep. between support schemes and on yep. which support scheme there's the highest. Yes, actually, of risk we premiums. We are going to, to extend the analysis. Uh, we focus on feeding tires, and we, we are going to do that for the feeding premium scheme also, which is that would be nice. different to the tariff I'm itself. Really yes. In the yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. well, thanks a lot, Christina, for your presentation. Thank thanks you. To all the presenters for the excellent presentations. Thanks to the audience for attending this, uh, this uh, concurrent.